Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for the second session of uh, Teaching Reading Comprehension Series with Janelle Wills. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Hawker Brownlow, since 1985 we have empowered uh, F to 12 teachers and educational professionals with the tools and skills such as these webinars to improve uh, classrooms and raise student uh, achievement. Um, just some tips for today's presentation. Uh, my name is Richard McKenzie and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Hawker Brownlow Education. I'm based in Melbourne. Um, I'll be the moderator for this session and I'd just like to run through some housekeeping items before introducing you to Janelle. So you've got a chat dialogue there, which uh, plenty of you have availed yourselves of uh, already. That's great. Um, you can use that to ask any technical questions, uh, any questions of Janelle, uh, send them to um, the username Hawker Brownlow Education for te a technical question. Otherwise, we really like to see um, content and engagement in there. So make sure when you're typing, you hit uh, all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see it and you don't get the situation where uh, you know, Janelle can see it, but no one else can see your really good idea. Um, and there'll be a Q&A at the end, so uh, type those questions into the chat box as well, and we'll uh, make sure we get around to them. Uh, and then if you'd like to contact us, feel free to email us at orders at hbe.com.au or join in the conversations on one of our social media platforms. Um, on the YouTube channel, which isn't in that slide, but it's at youtube.com forward slash Hawker Brownlow Ed. Uh, we've actually got the first session of this webinar and many other webinars available to view. Uh, so you can catch up on all our webinars there and other video content. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Janelle, who is the Director of Professional Learning at Hawker Brownlow Education. Uh, she works ex extensively with educators uh, schools and systems to implement research-based strategies uh, known to impact student achievement. She's the lead training associate in Australia and New Zealand for High Reliability Schools and the New Art and Science of Teaching and other Mazzano research titles. Uh, Janelle has authored or co-authored numerous books uh, and articles including the very recently released Thinking Protocols for Learning and Janelle's PhD thesis focused on gifted students with reading difficulties. It contributed to multiple fields of knowledge including special education, gifted education, assessment and feedback. And so with that I will pass you over to Janelle. Thank you. Thank you Richard. Good morning everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Again, for this second session, I have to admit but that my hands are absolutely shaking because just as um, we were about to get underway, we had some, some glitches. So um, thank you. Thank you for joining us and my apologies for that slightly late, late start. Um, so in this session, once again, um, I'm going to keep it nice and practical, but there will be that um, that uh, mixture of research and, and theory along with the practical. Um, I am going to, as I said last time in the Q&A, focus a little bit more on the important um, role of metacognition in reading and then jump into some really um, practical strategies. Like last time, I think that many of you online are going to find this very affirming. Uh, some of these things will just be reminders and things that you know, in the, in the busyness of of day-to-day of -day and let's face it, an overcrowded curriculum, sometimes some of these really important things go by the wayside. So so they're just reminders and hopefully, well, not hopefully, I know that you will, there will be some new things as well. Just as a reminder and for those who perhaps didn't join us for the first session, this is the um, model of reading that I am referring to that was put forward by um, Julia Sims and Robert Mazzano in their text, The Art and Science of Teaching Reading. And looking at all of those components that we know are important in terms of the development of skilled reading. So looking at word recognition, fluency, but my, um, and, and building on those foundation skills, of course, of in terms of um, concepts of print and tier one vocabulary. But for these sessions, I've chosen um, quite deliberately to focus in on comprehension. And uh, in next session, we're going to be looking at building academic vocabulary, which is the combination of tier two and tier three vocab. So that's where we're, we're heading. And just a reminder again, these are the comprehension strategies that I mentioned the grandfather or the godfather of um, this work, Pearson um, and his colleagues put forward, put forward in terms of the very important um, comprehension strategies that we need to develop for our students. 
I'm going to spend a lot more time this morning looking at monitoring comprehension and the important role metacognition has in developing uh, or, or having students think about the strategies that they're using. So before I get started, metacognition is, is it's one of those terms that has been in our vocab, in our educational jargon from you know, the late 70s into the 80s. And it's a term that just flies off our tongue that we don't always stop and think, what does it actually mean? So I'm just gonna stop for a moment. Um, if you wanna use the chat channel, go ahead. Uh, how do you define metacognition? Ah, thank you. Some people are uh, putting in their thoughts. Lovely. Actively and consciously thinking about thinking. Lovely. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, understanding thought processes as well. And that that piece around thinking about thinking, right, that's that one that just about, it does, it just rolls off of the tongue. And in fact, that is the literal definition of metacognition. It is literally John Flavel who introduced that term to us, first of all, actually referred to it as cognition of cognition, which then translates to thinking about thinking. But you almost go, well, okay, but can you fill me in on a little bit more? So let's have a look. Um, what's interesting about metacognition that it's actually, as you see here on the screen, responsible, and uh, Tony's uh, mentioning that there as well, being aware of our cognitive processes. And in fact, metacognition is responsible, as you see there on the screen, for monitoring, evaluating, and regulating all the functioning of all types of thought. So in terms of cognitive processes, um, and my critical and creative thinking, that's actually controlled by metacognition. And in fact, when we start to break that down, if we think about that cognition is the act of knowing, then metacognition is the learner's reflection, as you see here, about what he or she already knows or in the process of knowing. Now, John Flavel actually broke that down into two areas. He talked about metacognitive knowledge as well as metacognitive uh, regulation. Now, as I unpack this, just think about your students. So he said that it was awareness of knowledge, so understanding what we know, what we don't know, but what we want to know. So just think about some of our students, you know, they don't know what they don't know, right? They'll sort of come in, oh, I've got this, I already know. The other aspect is awareness of thinking, and this is what Tony was referring to before, I think, as well. So understanding the task at hand, being able to identify the steps that need to be taken to solve that problem. When I talk about this aspect, I often think about my son, very, very bright boy, but, and he would have these amazing ideas, absolutely incredible ideas, but he really struggled to know how to break that down. Um, and it was that aspect of metacognition that he was struggling with. The other one is, and you were, um, have all been referring to this in the chat channel as well, understanding the strategies um, and approaches that are going to help me solve that problem. So which strategies am I using that will actually get me to my goal? Um, because metacognition is very goal oriented. I've got a task, I've got a goal. How am I going in relation to that goal? And I've really got to be thinking about, um, are my strategies working? And that's where metacognition, metacognitive regulation comes into place. Um, and yet yeah, Jay's talking about looking at misconceptions, absolutely. Um, and it's actually, um, Jay, sometimes we talk about errors in reasoning and those unproduct, unproductive thoughts as well that get in the way of my thinking and thought processes. So metacognitive regulation comes down to, as you see here, that that planning, deciding on the strategy, organizing the, our thoughts and predicting a possible outcome, but very much then around monitoring. And as I mentioned um, previously, are those strategies working? Are they getting in the way? As Jay said, do we have misconceptions about a concept that um, are impacting on my learning? And then 
of course, um, assessing and evaluating the results. Did I, did I meet the criteria? Now, obviously, if we've got our students who are operating at that, that level of metacognition, the research shows us that they will learn and, and achieve at much higher levels than their peers. So it's worth spending the time looking at it. We do know that um, metacognitive behaviours and skills can be learned, but that they do need direct instruction. We can't just assume that our students are going to, to get this. Um, and the interesting thing as well is that metacognition is developmental, um, beginning in the early years and then maturing over time. In fact, what we know from the research is that it generally then tends to start to develop around age five when inner language is beginning to develop, when kids are aware of, ah, there's, you know, I am, it's something I'm thinking in my head. Um, and then it starts to become more formalized around age 11 as um, formal thought processes are developing. The other interesting thing, and particularly for those of you joining from a secondary context, is that the research to indicate that, as you see here from Baker, that developmental delays and lack of practice opportunities may explain why limitations in metacognitive functioning are still apparent in secondary school students and also up right through to, to university students. So it's something we really need to ensure that we uh, we spend the time. Um, it, it's it's uh, really important that we do develop these um, skills for our students. One of the best strategies um, that all the research, everyone will agree, that one of the best strategies in terms of developing metacognitive behaviours for our students is actually teacher modelling. It's why in reading or in anything, teacher think alouds are so incredibly important. And in essence, uh, our students learn best by imitating the significant adults around them. And those teachers who are openly metacognitive, who do do that think aloud or do do those think alouds for their students, research indicates they're much more likely to develop students who are metacognitive. Now, what does that look like from a reading perspective? Now, Harvey, uh, Stephanie Harvey and Anne Goodvitz actually talk about in terms of students developing metacognitive behaviours in reading, they actually go through four phases. First of all, they're quite tacit. They, they don't, they're not aware at all of how they think when they read. Um, and I, I guess they're really just focusing in on the decoding. Are they getting the words right? But they're not really conscious of, of their thinking at all. The next phase is that they do become more aware, and this is as that meta, those metacognitive skills are starting to develop. So as you see here, in their awareness, they start to realise that meaning has been lost, that what they're, um, it, it just doesn't make sense, um, that they're confused. But the problem is, at this stage, they don't have enough uh, reading strategies to address the problem. All they know is that it doesn't make sense to them. The next stage is when they're becoming more strategic. Um, this is when they're actually able to use those different comprehension strategies that we talked about previously. They are actually able to make predictions. They're asking questions. They're able to infer. They're drawing upon their background knowledge. Um, and they're able to um, monitor their understanding and they apply their reading strategies when meaning is lost. Now, the final phase, um, it's uh, more sophisticated. In this reflective phase, they're actually far more strategic about their thinking. And most importantly, they can use those comprehension strategies flexibly and move in and out of those. And they're very conscious of the types of reading strategies that they might use for different purposes. So if they're reading for pleasure, they're more likely to use, I guess, visualization and things like that. Um, and different strategies that they might apply when the focus is in on learning. And they then also are able to be very reflective of their thinking, thinking about what worked, what didn't work, and changing their reading strategies as required. So 
I'm just going to put all four of those stages back up on the screen for you and just get you to reflect for a moment on your own students. Obviously, you're going to have, and depending on the age of your students, um, you know, differences. But as you look at those four, which phase would most of your students be in, I wonder? I'll just give you a chance to read back over those and reflect on where you think your students might be. That's interesting, Tim. Yes, even at secondary. And I think you're, you're right because all they have, it's where they get really frustrated, right? Because they just go, oh, this doesn't make sense. But they don't have enough strategies to draw upon to actually rectify that problem. That's interesting. Elizabeth is agreeing. Wow, yeah, yeah. And isn't it interesting as well that they're not... Um, <laughs> you know, uh, able to, 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 to think about those, those differences as has, how they apply them. So this is why we really need to be explicitly teaching these um, reading strategies and reading, really talking with students about, you know, the different strategies that are going to work for different purposes. Um, I know that a couple of people were talking about the importance of oral language in this as well. And uh, that's music to my ears because that's one of the things um, I'm really passionate about, how important dialogue is um, for our students, particularly as we're um, at looking at all of these different, um, uh, de the development of these different strategies. Now let's just move on and start to look at, well, some practical, uh, practical strategies once again, and what that might look like. Oh, so, okay, so in reading, for reading comprehension now, um, when we start to talk about metacognitive knowledge, it's very much what we're trying to develop in terms of that metacognition is comprehension monitoring. Is this making sense? Um, so the goal changes a little bit. We're promoting students reading comprehension by increasing their metacognition, really getting them to start thinking about what strategies are working for me, is this making sense? So it's not just developing metacogn metacognitive skills for metacognitive for the sake of it, we're really focusing in on promoting students reading comprehension. And that's where one of, I referred to this uh, last time when we, we were together, um, I talked about the important role of um, reciprocal teaching. And in terms of uh, metacognition, it's a fabulous strategy for both comprehension fostering, but also comprehension monitoring. So it's seen as a, a really valuable tool in terms of developing metacognitive skills. And as you see there, that definition of reciprocal teaching um, is best represented as a dialogue between teachers and students in which participants take turns assuming the role of teacher. So eventually our students are actually leading that, that conversation. Now, in terms of reciprocal teaching and why it's so powerful, it's actually getting our students to really be conscious of these four uh, reading comprehension strategies, predicting, clarifying, question generating and summarising. Now, when we start talking and first introducing reciprocal teaching, usually it, it, it starts with the teacher modelling these and the teacher is going to be in control of those discussions. So she talks about, um, you know, what do we predict might happen next in this text and so forth. So what um, clarifying things that might be confusing, generating questions and then offering a summary. Now the next stage of reciprocal teaching is that that is handed over to the students. Now different people do this in different ways. In some approaches, they have one uh, student acting as the discussion leader and they lead everyone through the um, predicting stage, clarification stage and question generate, generation. And then usually another student is responsible for summarising. So that's one approach. In other approaches, they actually divide up the strategies. So one student has the role of predicting, one student has the role of clarifying, another question generating, and another summarising. And then as they read, um, at this stage we break the text up as they take on those different roles. And as they read the next piece of text, 
they swap roles so that they get um, an opportunity to experience all of them. Now, for those of you who are into stats, have a look at the effect size for the use of reciprocal teaching. Massive, 0.88. Remembering, what did John Hattie tell us? Anything over? 0.4 is worth considering. So an effect size of 0.88 is highly significant. And it's basically because it's a macro strategy. It's using all of those strategies and helping students be aware of how those strategies help them, so metacognitively, and how they can be used interchangeably. The other Oh, I agree, Elizabeth. I absolutely love literature circles as well. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to, to delve too, too far into those um, in this session. If you're into percentile gains, um, a, a 0.88 effect size translates to a 31 percentile point gain. So that basically means if I've got a control group, one group where reciprocal teaching is being used, another group where it's not being used, there can be 31% difference between the performance of one group and the other. So that's absolutely massive. And there's so much research around about, um, about that. Just to give you a quick, um, uh, th this is a, a table that comes from the Mizano Compendium of Instructional Strategies that I captured um, in, in my book and used obviously with permission. But I really like the way this one's organized. So you can see there, the four roles on the screen, the key words that students need to be able to uh, know and understand. And again, we would be explicitly teaching those, but then you've got these beautiful um, uh, sentence stems or, or question prompts that they can, that they can utilize um, as you read the headings and titles and look at the pictures. Can you predict what the text will discuss? So what you want to do when you have these, and you might even do these up on cards, um, uh, but use these initially uh, to scaffold, but eventually you want to be able to take those away so that this becomes more of a, a fluid conversation and they're not overly relying on those on those prompts um, as, as they work through each each role. Now, one thing that has occurred um, in sort of after that initial research that was conducted around the use of reciprocal teaching as a reading comprehension strategy, and often it sits there, um, literacy-based uh, work, uh, but this is recognising the literacy component of mathematics. So um, uh, researchers from QUT um, and also Monash actually did some studies where they looked at the use of reciprocal teaching in problem solving in mathematics and they had outstanding results. So this time the students go through the process, as you see still, of using those uh, four uh, prompt or four strategies, but this time in a mathematical sense, that's going to change just a bit. Now rather than me reading out each one of those, I'm going to stop and give you the opportunity to just read through the differences of those strategies when we're applying it in a mathematical sense. So in mathematics, as you see, that summarizing becomes a little bit different. It, it's more of a self-reflection um, in terms of the justification of the answer, really being metacognitively aware. Did our strategies work? Did they, um, uh, had a, and most importantly, this last one, did I contribute to the group in terms of problem solving as well? Now, just remember, I'm going through these at a rate of knots, but, um, at the end of this, all of this is actually um, uh, recorded. So you can go back and um, pause and stop and have a look at any of these that any of these slides that um, you may have missed. But I know there's a lot of um, secondary schools in particular who are still using um, using this approach and finding it um, highly, highly effective. Now let's uh, and just another very quick one, and this is term, in terms of that um, monitoring, and, and this is a co-constructed um, approach. But 
again, getting students to think, well, sometimes meaning breaks down and why might that be? Sometimes my mind starts to wander as I'm reading. Um, so thinking about, well, sometimes it's just that I'm tired. So what do I need to do? I might reread. I might put the text down because I just need to take a break from it. It might be that I don't have enough background knowledge. So what am I going to do? I'm going to focus and re read words more carefully than usual. Slow my, slow my reading pace down. Sometimes it can be impacted simply from we're thirsty, we're stressed, um, don't like the text, choose something else to read. It might be too hard think about what you know and try to connect to new information or find a different text. So very, very simple, but just talking explicitly with students around, well, what can I do when meaning breaks down? Um, now, I'm just going to give just a very quick pause. Um, I'm going to take a, a mouthful of water so that um, we can get on to the next piece. So a quick pause for you. Summarising just key points so far, what would you add? I notice people are making really strong links to other things that they know about. Um, so just an opportunity for you, quick pause. I'll take a quick mouthful of water. And then when we come back, um, I've got a whole bunch of really practical strategies that I'm going to share with you as well. So just quick, quick moment pause, and then we'll be back. Okay, welcome back. And I actually did forget to take that um, that uh, drink of water. Okay, now we were mentioning before the importance of oral language and dialogue. Um, now, here's some uh, research around uh, the amount of teacher talk in typical classrooms. Now, oh, I've actually jumped ahead. I was about to say, if you were to complete that sentence, what would you say? Um, how research shows that teachers talk in a regular classroom, what percentage of the time? I actually did a spoiler, spoiler alert and had put it up there already. So yes, look at that, 80 to 90% of the time is spent with teacher talk. And um, look at me, I'm, I'm doing all of the talking in, the, in this session. Now, it's not that we shouldn't talk, we need to talk. Um, but that's actually sort of out of whack, because um, we know how important that dialogue is, as we've, we've been saying. Now, that research was in 2009, as you see, but time flies, boom, boom. And uh, well, let's have a look at some more recent research. So um, this was some foundation research from uh, Peter Freebody that Edwards and Groves and Davidson um, built upon. But they were saying, look, even in 2017, that teacher talk still predominates in the classroom. And that is problematic when you think about Britain's beautiful quote here, that talk is the sea upon which all else floats. And when you think even about those strategies that we've already been talking about, um, you know, it, it, it's all um, built upon student dialogue. Now, I'm actually going to share with you a video and fingers crossed this is going to work. Um, it worked before we uh, joined uh, live. So hopefully it will, will work again here. Um, I'm going to show you a clip by Robert Mazzano. It's um, all about processing content and why that dialogue is so important. This clip comes from the Mazzano Compendium of Instructional Strategies, um, which is uh, an online uh, resource where Bob is actually going through a lot of these different uh, research-based uh, approaches and talking about how important they are. So I'm going to stop, play the clip. Hopefully it's going to work. If you can't hear it, just um, uh, let us know in the chat channel, but hopefully as I said, fingers crossed, it is going to work this time as we go through. So here we go. Here's Bob. 
For this element, during breaks in the presentation of content, the teacher engages students in actively processing new information. The research behind this, the research and theory, uh, again, has an intuitive appeal to it. But we might understand information, at least at uh, you know, first blush, but it's when we're asked to manipulate that information uh, in our minds uh, that uh, we really start to understand it and, what we understand, uh, and see what we understand and what we don't understand. Critical concepts here uh, include the processing of new information with emphasis on the new. Um, uh, here's what we know about new in information. Even if we understand it right away, uh, it's a fragile understanding. Technically understanding something means you get the big picture and what's important and what's not important, but it's very fragile in, in the beginning. And by that, I mean we have to go through it multiple times, look at it from multiple perspectives. Here are other people, uh, talk about it before we start making the linkage, linkage is solid, solid enough and clear enough that they'll be sustained over time. Student evidence as this is working would be, well, when asked, students can explain what they have just learned. So the processing, uh, the purpose of the processing is to get them more depth, uh, more understanding, uh, a clearer picture you know, of what, the, what has been newly pre presented to them and a better understanding of what they know and what they don't know. Students will volunteer questions, they'll volunteer predictions. When this is done in group work, uh, group members uh, ask each other and answer questions about, uh, about the information. Uh, group members will make predict predictions about what to expect next and then uh, move forward and verify if those predictions are accurate. So uh, processing information sounds very straightforward, uh, but it lives in a context that is very important. New, new information, you know, that's presented in small digestible bites, teacher uh, then choreographs the interaction the students have with that new knowledge. Okay, um, that was actually so difficult for me for because, although you could hear it, I actually couldn't. Um, but Bob is talking there around the importance of that opportunity to process if students are really going to deepen their understanding of uh, of, of concepts and. When we start to talk about, um, and Bob would have referred to this notion, we talk about um, breaking things down. You know, um, here's a small chunk of information or here's a small piece of text. Now um, read through that or listen to this text or whatever, and then an opportunity to talk and process that. Now, when we're talking about processing content, though, we're not just talking about, you know, just a quick turn and talk, um, that we really want activities as you see here that allow students to analyze that, that new information um, to facilitate their understanding. And the processes need to actually be well thought out and structured. And then not just simply sharing, but we want to augment their learning because we want that, that deepening as they struggle and grapple and clarify and, and question and, and go that little bit deeper. In, in terms of um, their understanding. So let's have a look at some strategies that can help us with that. Um, what I found was, and uh, quite often when we're introducing students and, and asking them to, um, to be engaged in conversations, um, sometimes we, we can have students who will, who will be really reluctant. Um, they don't just want to dive in to, to that discussion. And that's why that the um, structure is so incredibly important because it creates a, a sense of routine. And that routine then um, creates that consistency and the clarity so that the students know absolutely this is what we have to do as we work together. They're not unsure. Um, and once they're commonly understood routines, um, it lowers stress, and the potential conflict for within those groups. So we talk a lot about the norms in the group, the roles in the group. And then the final one, um, most importantly, that we're constantly modeling the strategies, demonstrating them, and they monitoring how effective they are. But most importantly, students have to practice them. I'm a great fan of the work of um, Laurie and Spencer Kagan. And I remember that as they don't talk about routines, they talk about structures. Um, but from memory, Laurie said something like, for it to really become embedded in our practice and a routine for our students, we have to use a strategy 
roughly eight times before it really becomes um, just something that we can almost do with automaticity. So any of these strategies, folks, please, um, you know, uh, use them. Don't don't try and use all of them. Pick a couple out um, and use them. Uh, consistently uh, until they just become, you, you can basically say, right, we're having a triad conversation. Students know immediately what they're expected to do. Um, so yeah, the other thing that Laurie always said was when we first model them is to do them content free. So that, you know, the kids are just talking about something um, that, that, that's not important. It might be just, you know, things that they've done on the weekend or things that they like or whatever. And we're, once they're familiar with the routine, then we're going to introduce the content. So that's another important tip there. Last time uh, we were, um, yeah, it is very much around cognitive load, Kim. Um, I shared with you, I really love this structure here. I mentioned that I'm a fan of Kylene Beer's work. Um, this one, when kids can't read what teachers can do. Um, last time I mentioned she was a secondary teacher, but a lot of these things I use across all year levels. Um, and I often use this one with when I'm working with adults. As you see here, again, we're breaking the text up. So instead of, you know, the students having to read a whole page, we're breaking it up into, you know, it might be paragraphs or sections. Um, students read that section, they highlight key key words, key ideas, as you see there. But what uh, in uh, in their small group, and, and I'm talking about a small group here, no more than four, um, one person would share a comment about one highlighted idea. And then, as you see here, in round robin fashion, have the group members comment on that shared point. And then the last word is shared for the um, the person who started, who put that forward. So they might um, make their own personal connection. They might sum up what everyone else has said or, or add to the original comment. So very simple, but very effective in terms of um, digging deeper and processing that information. This one is another one that I use a lot. Um, and uh, uh, a, B, each teach. Um, and I've just realised I've got a typo up there because I used this recently with groups of three. Um, but again, um, students decide on who is going to be A, who is going to be B. Each student reads their assigned section of text. So again, we're breaking it up um, that they're not having to read the, the whole text. So I might have one section, another person has the other section. And then on cue, each student has to teach their assigned section. And as we know, when you have to teach something to someone else, you've got a good understanding, right? I like this suggestion here as well in terms of a tip that the students should sit side by side with the text between them. And that ensures that they're constantly coming back to the text and that the text is the focus of the conversation. Um, and each student needs to provide a, a summary of the section that they have read along with key points. Now, whether or not you, you know, that might be, doesn't necessarily have to be, have to be written. So there's one. This is the triad uh, conversations that I was referring to previously. Again, so this obviously group of three. Um, again, they're assigned a letter, um, but this time they have a different role. Um, student A is asking questions. Student B is responding to those questions and student C is then recording those responses. Again, in, round, in each round, the students take on um, different roles so that, be, that they get an opportunity to experience all of those. And after each student has had an opportunity to respond, the group reflects on the ideas shared or information gathered to determine the information that they're then going to share with the rest of the class. So again, we use some question prompts. So the person asking, um, the person with the role of questioning might ask simply, what did you find most interesting about what you've just heard or read? And then the responder will be responding and um, the recorder will be quickly um, jotting those thoughts down. Here again, what was there anything that confused you? Um, how did it connect with what you already know? And is there anything you would like to know more about? So again, 
um, very metacognitive again, um, getting them to think about their understanding, monitoring that comprehension. Uh, but again, it's similar to uh, reciprocal teaching, they're involved in multiple uh, cognitive strategies there or comprehension strategies. The, I'm a real fan of this one and I use this a lot. Um, again, it, often in, in training situations, say and switch. Um, again, students, um, notice how small these groups are, by the way. Um, so they decide on who will be A, who will be B. They're given a particular topic. It might be what they've just read. Um, student A begins, has 60 seconds to tell B what they know about the topic or ideas they might have. Now, this the really good thing about this one is building up listening comprehension because B has to listen very attentively. At the end of 60 seconds, student B takes over the discussion. Now, they cannot repeat anything that question person B person A has said they can build on, they can clarify, um, or, or even, uh, you know, if, if A has misrepresented something, they can correct that, but they can't repeat. So they have to have listened very, very carefully. So you're actually also teaching a skill of paraphrasing here as well. Um, and now application, what you can do is also build in additional rounds and uh, make those reduce the time provided for each round so that's quite effective as well um, and then have students record their main points at the conclusion of the timed rounds that works nicely all of these are very quick easy to set up which is why I love them from a practical perspective another just quick one um, in terms of summary or the development of summaries, and now th this is literally just a reminder because I know that you would, would know these, but just how important um, one word summaries are because we find that when students are asked to summarise, they actually find it difficult to um, distill the key essence. By introducing limited word summaries, it forces them to actually, um, uh, to analyse. Um, and um, I will distill the information down to one key point and, and most importantly, prioritise that critical um, content. So very simple, but pow very powerful. Um, now, one of the things that uh, we always make sure is that there's a couple of stages here. So yes, they're going to create that one word summary of what they've just read or heard, but then most importantly, they have to justify why they chose that word and, and explain that um, which, which is absolutely vital. What I'm going to do as a teacher here is collect those one word summaries. I am going to share them with the students. We might analyze them. Sometimes people create wordles of those one word summaries, um, but I'm going to use it formatively as well. Are the students actually able to distill that information? Can they prioritize the critical content? And within those rationales, am I seeing any errors in reasoning or any misconceptions that I need to address? So very simple, very powerful. Uh, yeah, Catherine, the headline task works in a similar way. Any of those, um, uh, as I said, any of those limited word summaries work beautifully. One adaptation of that that is quite challenging actually, give this a go, it's again, um, the students create their one word, right? But then they work in a small team, around about four people, you don't want more than six, but they share their words and then they have to try to make a sentence out of their words. Now they can add in additional words, but they've got to try and keep those to an absolute minimum and have as few other words as possible. But their sentence has to relate back to the topic and um, highlight how the, 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 the critical information. That process, very powerful. The thinking and the dialogue that occurs in that process is really quite outstanding. Have a have a go. Um, I often use sticky notes for that one. Just checking for time so that we allow time for for questioning as well. This is one that I adapted from, um, as you see there, um, Boquet. I think is is the um, uh, 
pr pronunciation of the name. What I did was use the metaphor of an iceberg. So this one is more around inferring. And as you see on the screen, trying to encourage students to dig below the surface level of the information that has been presented to them. So that notion that the, this is what we've been given, this is the top of the iceberg, but what's sitting underneath that that we can't see? What's the author's agenda? Is there bias? Has, is um, are, are the generalizations um, or omissions? So I just simply use a template like this with the um, iceberg up the top. This is what we're being told, right? So that goes up here. But what's, let's have a look at a deeper level. What's our interpretation and why? And they can use in terms of digging in deeper into the author's viewpoint, here are some of the guiding questions. What's the source of this information? Is it reliable? Um, are there any other sources that can be can verify this information? What's the author's purpose? Is the author biased? Whose viewpoints are represented? Most importantly, whose viewpoint or perspective is missing? So this is very much into that critical literacy. And Tim's sort of asking the question, could this metaphor for analysing, a, could, be, could it be used? Yeah, in a complex question, I'm sure it could. Um, it, again, you know, th this is what we're being told. It's something similar, actually, Tim, this might help with that. Is this one, this is what we're told, or this is the information that we're given and they fill out each of these pieces. This is what we already know. Now, quite deliberately, um, that's been kept small so that they have to um, become very succinct. They don't have a lot of um, space to write. This is what we think we know, and this is what we think we need to find out. So possibly, Tim, that might be able to be used in that, in that context that you are asking about. Okay, now one last thing that I'll just finish with is this reference here to knowledge maps. Um, really, I guess they're graphic organisers, but just how important they are um, from uh, the comprehension perspective in, in terms of how they help um, students understand the structure of text and how that can um, you, they can use that to sequence and, and look at cause and effect and things like that. So what you will find in, and this is a plug, I guess, for the new art and science of teaching reading, but um, Julia Sims and Robert Mazzano have created a whole bunch of knowledge maps uh, for different types of text. So you'll see here, this is the knowledge map for a comparison. So these are the items, um, the characteristics that will be um, compared and then similar, how are they similar, how are they different? And then always, always, always with that um, type of map that they create a summary of the comparison that they've made. This is another one, um, breaking down an argument and that's the map for, the, um, for an argument. Um, what's the initial claim? Breaking down, identifying what are the grounds? Um, what's the backing for that ground, for those grounds? Um, is there particular data, is there research? And then have qualifiers, is there a qualifier or are there qualifiers? Um, for younger students, we might just focus in one piece, but for older students, they can um, delve into more complex texts. Um, just by the way, that map is also brilliant for students to actually, um, uh, for the development of their own uh, uh, arguments as well and this lends itself as well to, to starting to look at you know is is the backing sound is it logical are the references strong and so on and so forth now although I love the use of maps like this and um, graphic organizers I've also found this is incredibly effective um, where students have more of a free-flowing web or they're, they're able to design their own way of organising this. Now, as you see, the, these students are about year seven. Now, all I've done here is, you know, in uh, office works and places like that, they have all those fabulous um, sticky notes that are shaped in different ways. All I've done here is laminate them. These are um, cards, same thing um, that I've just simply laminated. What I find really good um, or useful, and students tend to like the tactile nature of this. So the students, uh, what you can see here, I'll show you another slide as well. They're highlighting the key points. 
um, this is looking at chapter two. Um, this is actually looking at a, a sequence of events. Um, the child is writing on the on the uh, laminated sheet, and um, these can all be moved. And well, sometimes we used to do big classroom versions of it as well. But I just find the students like to be able to manipulate them, and they like the, the ability to rub off and correct things as well. But they then utilise that to create their summary at the end, um, which, which is highly highly effective um, rather than them, you know, what often happens when you ask a student to create the summary, they almost rewrite the chapter, right? Or this is for, for younger students as well, anyway. So, so I'm gonna stop there because we are looking now at 5-2 um, and we always try to um, put in um, um, time for questions. Just looking at Tracy's comment there. Yeah, uh, Tracy, that's a lovely metaphor that you're using in terms of those weaker learners. Just a lot of these things, actually, um, way, way back, um, I used a lot of the thinking strategies, um, a lot of De Bono's work, um, a lot of these different things, you know, I've adapted them from different places as I've collect them, collected them over time. Um, as I mentioned last time, I use a lot of the visible thinking routines. I love them. I often did these things to support my weaker learners because it was great scaffolding and we'd have anchor charts everywhere and um, then when they came to write, that they were great supports. Funnily enough, when I moved away from, I, I, moved, I was living and teaching in central Queensland, I went to teach on the Sunshine Coast and people said, oh, you're doing all of those things for um, thinking strategies. Um, are you really interested in gifted ed? Which actually I am, but... The point was these strategies were for all kids um, and they were really, really useful. Uh, obviously my gifted kids would just run with them, but these were wonderful supports for my kids who were just struggling that little bit. I'm gonna stop and, and give you a chance to uh, see if Richard's got some, um, some questions coming through there. Thank you, Janelle. Um, yes, please keep some questions coming through. We uh, love to hear from you. Um, just on the recording, the recording will probably be available next week sometime. We'll let you know when. Uh, we'll pop it up onto onto YouTube and we'll shoot out an email um, when it's all ready to go. Um, question there from Tony. Uh, <laughs> I just have you written that a book specifically <laughs> around your thesis? <laughs> Oh, Tony, um, Hawker Brownlow, I think, would like me to. Um, yeah, and, and I think there was a question that came up last time about give to kids with reading difficulties or disabilities. And um, I, it's such a broad topic, I couldn't really, oh, sorry, such a, so specific, but then in depth, uh, not really, uh, I couldn't go into it in detail in this session. But i um, happy if anybody's interested in that, that that's an absolute passion. Um, so I'm happy to, to talk to people about it. But yeah, Tony, I'll, I, yes, I, it's one of those things that uh, I probably should and need to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of wrote a book on thinking protocols instead so that yeah well i think we can all agree that they're um both very important topic areas um yeah. and and you know one feeds into the other in many ways um from jasmine you mentioned uh questioning clarifying predicting summarizing where do you see what thoughts inferring and visualizing, creating a picture in mind as metacognitive strategies for making meaning during reading? Uh, very important as well. Um, I sort of skipped over that, um, but I, I guess it's always about um, uh, getting students to think about how does that support them or, and, and being careful, I guess, too, is just the, um, that the visualization doesn't allow them to become distracted or um, uh, sort of have their mind wandering too far to bring that back. Um, but definitely a really important skill and uh, one that, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to talk a lot next week actually in terms of vocab development, just how important visual um, visual visual cues are so so that'll come back in uh, again next week and some of the different strategies that we can use for that but yeah absolutely um, and again really with students I think 
um, what becomes important is is modeling for them um, some of that like what you're picturing and, and the rest of it yeah but definitely and, uh, uh, absolutely Jody was saying it helps with writing I always say that um, all of these things that that's that connection between reading and writing isn't it you know that uh, as we do all of these things it actually they become um, I then want to do, do like I, I apply these things in my own writing um, there's a question from uh, Catherine saying I have a student with writing delay who is gifted I'd love to know where to go to, to learn more about that um, I'm just trying to think of there's a lot of research around uh, gifted students with learning difficulties um, and yeah uh, hmm, I, I can't just think of one 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 spot but you could certainly I know I delved into a lot um, with spelled S P E L D um, wonderful organization and also the so I'm, I'm speaking more from a Queensland perspective now, but um, the Queensland Association for Gifted and Talented Children um, would certainly have, um, they'd be able to put you on the right track. Um, and then there's also the same associations in every um, mm. state. And there's yep. also the national body as well. Yeah, if you, um, whatever state you're in, Catherine, um, have a look and, and certainly one of those bodies will be able to point you in the right direction, I think, with either... Uh, resources or strategies or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I think, think we're that probably on about time. <laughs> wraps us up for today. Yeah. So, thank you, Janelle. Thank you for your your expertise yet again, uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's been really uh, really great time, and we do appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. We know that um, it's not easy, or uh, you know. The, this time is precious and valuable to you as educators so thank you uh, enjoy your day and we look forward to seeing you again uh, next week same time 9am on the 27th yeah same time same bat channel um, right. to talk about vocab thank you everyone so much thank you thank you